Mm. Hi everyone, uh, while we're waiting on a few more people to join us, I'll start the introduction. So welcome to the In It Together series. It's part of a series put together by a few different organisations to help motivate and inspire everybody, despite these difficult times and our new normal. So today we'll be talking about confident communication, and I think all of us can agree we can all um, be a little bit more confident and communication is obviously key to most of the things that we do. So my name is Paul McMahon, I'm the Engineering Together founding chair and I'm joined by some of our other organisers uh, including Joe and Victoria and Laura and thanks to everybody for organising it because without everybody's input these things don't happen. Um, but our main event um, is we're going to hear Mimi Musu talk about uh, her journey and how she became more confident. And uh, Mimi will, will talk first. And then we'll hear from Natalie Chung. Natalie is an enterprise coordinator and does a lot of social value. And uh, she'll help us uh, by telling us about how she got to where she was and also some hints and tips that we can all use. So just a reminder, this event is being recorded. If you can keep yourself muted, that would be great so we don't end up with awful feedback. Um, feel free to keep the camera on, but obviously if you do have bandwidth issues, switching it off saves a lot of bandwidth and a lot of energy. Uh, we're gonna use the chat for uh, questions, but we're gonna answer them after our two speakers and we're gonna have plenty of time at the end for chat. And if you can start your question with a queue, that would help uh, our moderator, Joe, uh, just identify which are questions and um, if you have to share your name and what organisations uh, you're from, Joe will obviously uh, say that as part of, of your questions. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Mimi. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi, thank you so much for having me first and foremost. Um, I'm really excited to speak about confident communication because doing this presentation also helps me with my confidence. So, howdy ho. Let me share screens, get my presentation up. Right. So as Paula said, um, my presentation is more about a journey of confidence. And at the end, I'll give some hints and tips and things I've been involved with um, over the past three or four years. So first and foremost, my name is Mi Mosu and I'm a civil engineer at Sorba Calpine, specialising in concrete quality and production. So my story starts when I was uh, growing up a bit younger. I was always labelled as bubbly, friendly, outgoing and pretty much a social butterfly. None of my friends were the same. I was the one on the playground who would hang around with anybody. However, being this bubbly and overconfident young child, I was always told at school that I should dream big. But then when I told them that I, the certain career aspirations I wanted, I was told not that big and I should be extremely realistic. So because of this, um, I wasn't that confident at sixth form in myself or in my studies. And as a result of this, I didn't really do well at A-level. As we can see, I got a U in one of my biology mocks because I allowed what my teachers thought of me to get to my head. So anyway, um, following on from that, I went to university and I studied a course that I wasn't interested in at all. However, I decided to change to engineering due to a chance encounter with a friend and this changed the whole course of my life. So I loved university. I really enjoyed meeting new people, being involved in various activities and most importantly, I loved studying civil engineering. One of the things I wanted to improve with myself at university was my public speaking skills and get the confidence back that I did lose when I was at sixth form. So university is great for these things because you can do group work, presentations, class discussions, and even just raising your hand to ask a question. So for example, I would sit in a lecture of about three to 400 people um, studying, studying civil engineering or civil engineering related courses. And I remember one day I said to myself, I really don't understand what's going on and the exam is in two days time. If I don't ask now, I'm never gonna know. So I put my hand up in front of 400 people and I said, sir, I don't get it. And it was one of the most groundbreaking things for me because a lot of people in the room also didn't understand. And it was from then I kind of said to myself, I'm never gonna hold myself back, but that's exactly what I did at sixth form. I sat there and I thought everything was happening to me and I didn't take charge 
of my life and my career aspirations, I suppose. Then um, I was that person in my group uh, of friends, when, my civil engineering friends that was, that when we were doing um, coursework or studying for our exams, I was the one who would uh, relay complex information and make it sound very simple. And then I remember one day I was doing that in the library with about 20 people in the group pre-COVID, um, 20 people in the group. And my lecturer came up and said, you know, Mimi, your communication skills are fantastic. And that is what will make you do really well in industry. It's going to take you so far. And I said to myself, is he saying that I won't be a good civil engineer? And I was like, well, no, but there are qualities in public speaking and good communication that can be contributed to the um, engineering and construction industry. So I thought that's what I'm going to focus on. My technical abilities can be worked on, but I'm actually going to use my voice to make the biggest impact. And that's what I plan to do. However, when I got to work, I remember I would go into all these networking events for engineering. And one of the events I went to said we should do the Myers-Briggs test. I'm not sure if anybody knows what the Myers-Briggs personality test is, but essentially, um, it's a, a test of 50 questions and they make you answer them and it tells you the type of personality type you have and she groups you into four types of personality so you have an analyst oops, a diplomat a sentinel or an explorer and I remember being really excited thinking wow I'm going to actually find out about who I am using this test so when I got to the event um, they said oh yeah let everyone discuss um, what personality types they were and what I realized in this event was that most people um, most of the engineers in the event had the same personality type. Most of them fell into the analyst or the sentinentals. So when they asked me, what personality type are you? I said, oh, I'm an ESPF, the entertainer, which is the explorer group down at the bottom here. And they said, oh, and I was like, oh, what's wrong with that? Then I remember when I was reading it. So what Myers Briggs does when you get the answer, she will give you a report based on an introduction to your personality type, how you'd be in a job, how you've been in a relationship, um, how you'd be as a manager, how you'd be as a subordinate, et cetera. And one topic that was important to me was career paths. So I remember reading about the career paths and it said that I should do things like marketing, social media management, I should be on TV, I should be a tour guide, which are obviously fantastic things that I think I would benefit greatly from doing. However, I was an engineer. So when everyone looked at me a bit funny and said, oh no, like maybe you should be doing something else, it really, really um, dented my confidence again. And I remember going home to my mother and I said, mom, this is what's happened um, at this event. Maybe engineering isn't for me. Maybe the Myers-Briggs personality test is right. Maybe I should be doing something else. And my mom said, how, how can you say that there's one personality type for an engineer? Engineers are so diverse and so different. Is there really one type of engineer? That's impossible. So it was from then I said, okay, my mom's right again based off what my lecturer said as well, I'm going to use the skills that I have to, in order to change the industry and make an impact. And again, that was communication. So I suffered from a lot of, I suffered from quite a bit of imposter syndrome due to not just the master's personality test, but a number of things that have happened. And I said to myself, I'm gonna build my confidence back. One way of doing that was at work. Um, I was able to ask questions, I started speaking to my colleagues, engaging with supervisors and engaging with all our supply chain and actually being more involved in these exercise in like uh, team building exercises and developing a healthy response to failure. Another thing I did was visualize success and what that means to me. Um, I actually have a vision board and I ensure that those things are ticked off and I know that everything that I'm doing I'm actually working towards something which actually allows me to keep steering and wake up every day to do these certain things. Number three, um, I acknowledge my achievements so I have been awarded um, by the Institution of Civil Engineers so sometimes when I feel to myself maybe I'm not such a good engineer I remind myself I've actually been awarded by the home of civil engineering so I must be somewhat decent and the final thing is that I to myself every day I am because I said I am so most mornings I do personal affirmations which helps me build my confidence so a lot of people always ask me but Mimi why do you always do this public speaking why do you engage in so much STEM activity why do you why do you feel it's so important to do all of these things and I think it's important to do this because I want people who are like me who maybe don't fit the mold of engineering to feel that they can be confident being who they are I also want to give back to my community. 
I love inspiring people and I don't want others to feel like how I was made to feel at school. Like I couldn't contribute to society. Like I couldn't dream big. Like I couldn't be like um, some of the other, some of my other schoolmates. Also being an engineer has made me extremely confident. I want to see a change in an industry that I absolutely love. So yes, I will definitely talk about it. Also people need to see the diversity in engineering and how multifaceted we are. So for example, I'm an engineer a world traveler, a massive mummy's girl, and sometimes I like to wear makeup and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Also, I public speak to remind myself, just because someone said I don't fit the mold of engineering doesn't make me any less of an engineer. So I am what I said I am, and I am an engineer. Lockdown. So obviously due to lockdown, people may be thinking, oh, how do you still um, engage with the youth, et cetera, et cetera. Even I thought that to myself. I used to go to schools and do face-to-face -face speaking engagements. And I thought, wow, how am I gonna still do this when we're in a lockdown? But then I remembered social media. So social media is so fantastic to me because it's made it so easy to reach people globally from your bed. So I found ways other than just public speaking, maybe not just on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, but also I've used video content, pictures with captions, blog posts, I've written technical articles and I've done podcasts, et cetera. Through social media as well, I've been able to speak to 21,000 people at one time during a conference um, about my journey into engineering during this lockdown. That is the largest audience I've ever done. And I thought what really helped me with that as well was that it was on Zoom and it was a thing where I couldn't see them, but they could see me but I can see the number of participants. So it kind of gave me the confidence to kind of keep going because, okay, they can't see me. I mean, I can't see them, but they can see me. So it kind of helped me a little bit with um, confidence boosting. Also, social media has um, provided me with so many opportunities. So for example, one of my first um, outbreaks into social media was, I wrote a LinkedIn post about my journey to civil engineering, and that was nicely posted by the IC, by the IC, by the IC institution. And it was voted this year as a fo the fourth, the fourth most popular blog of 2020, which was a big thing for me. So I thought, wow, people are actually reading my journey and the IC is global. And I've had so many people contact me from all over the world to tell me, how fantastic I am and how much they've been inspired and how, how they want to get into engineering, et cetera. I've also written for the, for the Guardian. I've been part of the ICE podcast. I did the STEM ambassador podcast with Natalie, actually. Um, I post my day-to-day -day work on Instagram and I also talk about my journey on Twitter. One of my biggest outbreaks has been my Miss versus Reality video that I recently produced with the ERA Foundation and Born to Engineer that has harnessed over 100,000 views across social media platforms. And to me, that is crazy because I sit from my bed most days and I'm like, wow, like I'm actually touching people, um, touching people's hearts, inspiring people, etc. And I made one video to do that. And I've even had people from, for example, um, somebody contacted me from Fiji, a remote island near Australia that I have never been to and said, oh, um, Mima, I saw your video and I'm really inspired by what you do and they wanna be an engineer themselves, which is absolutely fantastic. So just to kind of round things off, just a few tips I would, I would give about public speaking or um, just social media engagement, et cetera. Um, talking about what you love. So I love concrete. So I talk about material science and my journey into engineering and construction because that is what I know. Number two, Find a way of communicating that suits your style. So as I said, you don't have to stand on the stage and talk to over a thousand people. You can talk on um, social media, you can talk on, on Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Also make yourself comfortable and make sure you're comfortable with the topic, make sure you're comfortable with the environment that you're um, gonna be speaking on or the platform that you'll be um, creating the blog post, et cetera, et cetera. If it is public speaking you're doing, I would suggest practicing. Practice makes perfect. Practice gives you social cues when you're looking at your presentation, et cetera. Number five, gather, inf gather enough information um, as possible about the event or the topic to be discussed, just to make yourself feel comfortable once again. And remembering your audience. So tailoring your language to your audience and also engaging them. So sometimes when I do a presentation, I don't know if it's going well or not. Sometimes I crack a joke. Whether that will land or not is a completely different story, but it makes me feel comfortable. And number seven is to use personal anecdotes. I've noticed even I um, fell foul of this once. When I used to listen to um, people public speaking, I always thought that 
they weren't kind of human, nothing bad ever happened to them, and they lived such a fantastic life. But using personal anecdotes reminds people that you are a human being and you do go through things on a daily basis. And also number eight, kind of the same as using personal anecdotes, being genuine, because people want to relate to somebody. So if you're not genuine, and if you're not genuine, then it's, it's, it kind of gives a false sense of reality. And also, people can tell when you're trying to be somebody that you're not. So it's just important to be who you are and people will accept you for that regardless. Just some lasting comments. Um, number one, no one is born confident. Um, confident has its peaks and troughs. So as I've just explained through my story, I have been up and down for the past couple of years. Um, it's okay to be nervous. Being nervous is actually quite healthy. Um, it means that, you, and it also shows people that you care. And number five, I mean, number four, sorry, is to try something that takes something, try something that takes you out of your comfort zone. Um, only you can do that. And if you want to be, if you want to reach a level where you are confident to do something, taking one step out of your comfort zone, taking a step out of your comfort zone, comfort zone bleh, is the first step. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my journey and you can contact me anytime. Um, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn and also my Twitter and Instagram are also my personal account. So I always say to people at your own risk, but thank you so much for listening. <laughs> thank you, Mimi. That was great. So um, we'll go over to Natalie next, whenever Natalie's uh, ready, that would be great. And then as we said, we'll have questions and answers at the end, and then we can ask questions to both speakers or one speaker, and um, that would be great. Over to you, Natalie, thank you. Hi, hopefully you can see my slides now. Bear with me, I'm just trying to figure out what's on what screen. Okay, hi everyone. Um, lovely to meet you all. And thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. I'm really excited to be here and share something which I'm really, really passionate about because I recognize that communication skills in lots of different ways are um, like really crucial, not just in your professional lives, but also in your personal lives. And I'm gonna be focusing mostly on like public speaking, um, but of course there's many different types of communication. And yes, Mimi's right. Um, I interviewed her actually as a standout STEM ambassador as part of my previous role um, uh, on the STEM sessions podcast. So definitely check that out if you haven't heard enough from us today. Um, so a bit of an introduction about me. Um, while I don't work as an engineer now, I do have a background in civil engineering, particularly in the railways. And like Mimi, I'm also an e is it ESFP the entertainer. I'm the same one. What are the, what are, what are the chances? Um, but now Natalie. I work in careers education and employability, particularly focusing on schools. And this actually started off with me volunteering as a STEM ambassador when I was... Um, an undergraduate student at uni um, and that's how I started my public speaking presenting journey. Uh, yeah Paula? Sorry Natalie, You're, we're actually seeing your uh, speaker view on PowerPoint instead of the uh, presentation view so we're actually it's almost like you know one of them uh, you're looking at sure, okay. the let me, um, seeing it. <laughs> sorry about that let me unshare okay, no and problem reshare it'll just make it if there's anything small on it it'll just make it a lot easier for us to see natalie don't worry is, that, about it. is that better no i think you might be sharing the wrong screen bear with me that's all right and this is what confidence is all about people is uh when it goes wrong as it inevitably does <laughs> plowing on regardless thanks natalie that's brilliant how about now yep fab Okay, great. Um, where was I? Yeah, so now I work in careers education, which involves working with volunteers that like STEM ambassadors to interact with young people for work experience weeks and presentations at schools. And yes, we've been able to see things that we never would have thought could be delivered virtually over Teams and Zoom. We've been seeing that being able to be delivered to young people um, while we're working in this way over the last strange year. So it's been really great actually to be able to pivot and there's a lot of opportunities for young people to see different things that aren't necessarily in a commutable distance in their local area. So more experiences of the workplace, which is always good for raising aspirations. 
Um, I'm a massive advocate for women in STEM, and it's actually the topic of sort of one of the most nerve-wracking talks um, or public speaking that I've ever done, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. And I sit as a council member on the Women's Engineering Society. Um, I'm also a podcaster and a public speaker, which is something I've started doing as a freelancer, which is really exciting. It's not something I ever would have considered. And the opportunity started coming up. And why I share that is because even if you don't see yourself as a quote public speaker, that doesn't actually um, necessarily mean that those opportunities won't come up in the future. And I have um, a picture of me at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in a pre-COVID time working on camera. And also um, that's my podcast there. It focuses on East and Southeast Asians sort of living in the UK, which is a really underrepresented group if you're looking in mainstream media. And something I want to share, if you wouldn't mind while I just have your ears, is that there's a lot of, of anti-Asian um, race-related, COVID-related discrimination going on, including physical violence. And it's something which uh, my community are very fearful of in a time when we should be happy about coming out of lockdown. But unfortunately, we are expecting a rise in um, these sort of hate crimes. And I hope it's something that you can sort of give it a time to uh, raise awareness about and just be aware about it because there may be people in your circles and your loved ones and among your colleagues who are worried about this um, at the moment and have been over the last over a year. Um, okay, so let's actually continue on with confidence communication. The reason that I'm sharing this, as I said, is because it can have so many different effects at different parts of your lives. Um, here's just a few examples at times when we will use our voices, share what we want to share. And Often um, people only think of the times when they have to deliver a slideshow like I am now in a team meeting or to a client, but many other times that you'll be um, wanting to use your voice to share your story or where you're coming from. And re it really is about sharing um, your own expertise and your own experiences. So Mimi mentioned imposter syndrome, actually, it's on my next slide. Um, we could do a whole other session about sort of what you want to share for a different situation, a particular talk or engagement with young people. Um, but just remember that what you know, your experience is unique to you. There's no one else who can share your story. Um, Mimi's got her story. I've got my experiences and everyone else will have their, their own individual unique experiences. So never feel like it's something which... Um, I think we're very, it's, it's very common for people to think that someone else would be better at doing it, but no one can share your story in the way that you can. So please remember that um, it's definitely something that I keep in mind for imposter syndrome because, um, yeah, no one else can actually do it. I'm not pretending to be somebody else. A question of reflection I would like you to think about is the time when you have overcome fear. Um, something which I recognise a lot of people get really nervous about is public speaking. Um, it's just seen as very normal to feel nervous about it, regardless of your experiences or, or um, how um, experienced you actually are and having delivered talks in different places. Um, regardless of that, a lot of people do seem really, really um, fearful of it. And the reason I would like you to sort of reflect on the time after today's session that you've overcome fear is that often when we look back at things, it was nowhere near as scary as we anticipated. We spend way more time being nervous about it in the run up to an event or a, a job interview or whatever it was. And actually, when it's over, when we look back, we think, oh, you know what? I was capable the whole time I was capable of doing that. Um, and that's good to remember for the next time we, we feel nervous or anxious in the lead up to something. So a time when I did some public speaking that I was particularly nervous about was um, it was for a youth conference. I got nominated by a charity that I volunteered with um, as a youth speaker. So they were wanting to put young people's voices at the centre of the event. Um, I got nominated for this amazing opportunity that I never would have put myself up for normally. And um, so I'm really grateful to the charity staff for considering me. And they um, nominated me for this TED coaching. So it was actually delivered by the people behind TED Talks, which I think we've all watched. Really incredible. Lots of different um, topics have been shared in TED Talks. And I was going to receive public speaking coaching from TED and deliver a talk on a massive stage. I actually have some pictures. 
in my next slide. Um, it was held in the Excel Center. I think there were literally thousands of people in the audience from all over the world. There were over 100 countries represented in the audience, which was, yes, really nerve wracking. And of course, I shared my favorite topic all about women in STEM, promoting engineering everywhere I go. And this was particularly nerve wracking because in the week coming up to it, I did the awful thing, which I would not recommend to every, anyone ever, um, of completely procrastinating. So I didn't want to prepare my talk and I just left it and left it and left it and pushed it right until the last moment when I thought, you know what, I have to do it now, otherwise I'm not going to have any, I'm not going to know what I want to say. Um, so because I was so nervous, I was actually avoiding it procrastinating it and I don't know if anyone else can ever relate to something like this when the task is feels so big that you don't want to do it and you actually end up making it much worse for yourself um but that was my experience of definitely something I was super nervous about in the run-up to it strangely on the day like peering through the curtain at the audience I was strangely serene and not nervous on the day and it ends up going really well and it's probably yeah one of my proudest achievements to date definitely a uh, real accumulation of different things in my volunteer experience that has given me this opportunity. Um, I want to share you a snippet from a school report. So like Mimi showing her uh, proudly well, taking a picture with her school subject bad to grade. Um, I have a school report, which I've recently found. I don't know if anyone has been doing any lockdown house clearing or um, spring cleaning, but I've definitely thrown away a lot of things from my childhood and one of these things was this school report where they said that I was really quiet um, and a little too quiet really and this is something I want to share because often when we think about public speaking we think that it's something that someone else is good at it someone else can do it better than me and it's not part of my identity it's actually a part of our identity whether or not we're, we're interested or fearful of public speaking. And I definitely was not a chatty, confident young person, but it's something that I've built up over time. So my tips for public speaking and for finding my voice are the following, to keep it um, just to four. First one is to seek out opportunities. So I had gained sort of more and more experience from um, starting off by being a STEM ambassador as a university student, presenting in front of a group of maybe 10 other student volunteers or 30, a class of uh, teenagers, growing my audiences sort of bigger and bigger as I sort of stretched my comfort zone. And I would say that um, my next tip is to really just give it a go. Um, when the charity nominated me for the TED coaching and the speaking opportunity, I really easily could have turned it down and said no that's not really for me that sounds really scary and I don't think I'm the right person for it but actually I didn't I gave it a go and that was really something that I'm grateful for because um, I just said yes and then figured the rest of it out later uh, which I knew I was um, looking back now I should have known that I was capable the whole time third one which is something I really like a lot of people say fake it till you make it and this is something which I've definitely lived by in the past um, but now I, I don't really like it. I don't think you should be pretending to try to uh, fake a different persona in order to get by in your careers or in our lives. Um, but instead, I like to say, mistake it till you make it. So don't be afraid to fail. Go out there, give it a go. And when you try it, you'll learn things from it. So whether it goes well or, or badly, or sometimes we think it goes badly, but actually to the audience, it was completely fine and actually really great. Um, but we learn something from every time we push ourselves out of our comfort zone. So don't be afraid to fail and mistake it till you make it. And the last one is feel empowered, because when you are a confident speaker, when you are confident um, at communicating in different ways, there are so many different things that you can do, including ad advocating for other people who might not have that platform or that voice, um, which is something which is really important for sort of diversity and inclusion and also um, our charity work and advocacy. Um, and I hope that we can all recognize that. So a big quote on the right hand side, we are all a work in progress. And being confident or being a good public speaker is never something where you, you get to a certain level when you've completed it, you've finished it. That's never going to be the case. It's always going to be the case that we are pushing ourselves a little bit more out of our comfort zone. And even though now I don't really get nervous when I'm speaking in front of people, 
um, after I've done that talk, I think all my nerves just completely disappeared from my body and I don't really get nervous anymore. But there are times when I do feel outside of my comfort zone. For example, this time last year where we started working virtually and I had to start presenting to large groups where I was the only one with a camera on. And actually, I found that really, really bizarre because you can't really get that two way communication between myself and the audience. I can't read their body language or even see if they're following along with what I'm saying. And even though um, I'd, I would have described myself as a confident speaker before that, that definitely was an example of something which is out of my comfort zone at the time and perhaps something that you have experienced as well. So I just said that we're all a work in progress and I really recommend, you know, these are my four tips that I live by and I recommend to those around me as well. Uh, seek out opportunities, give it a go, mistake it till you make it and ultimately feel empowered. And that's how we become more confident in our communication and maybe one day be sat outside the podium like this lady here. <laughs> well, um, I'll have a look at the chat and see if there are any questions, but I'll hand it back to Paula. But thank you so much again for having me here today. Well, thanks, Natalie. Uh, that was very inspiring. I mean, that Excel Centre looked absolutely, truly amazing. So if everybody puts in uh, the questions into the chat, uh, if we can actually, so there's lots and lots of wonderful comments coming in. If we can start them with a, with a queue. So Joe, who's gonna moderate the questions, knows uh, to ask. And it can be a sort of question to both speakers or a question to just an individual speaker. But while we're waiting on a few questions to come in, I've just got to say, I've been blown away by both of you ladies. Um, you know, the resilience that you've shown, the get up and go, um, and the fact that you've that you've actually got some great messages um, and that you've, you know, you've given them messages to so many people is such an inspiration to everybody. And it just shows that, you, you know, you weren't born with it, um, but it is really, really good that you can, um, you know, just go out and do it anyway. And uh, they're both absolutely brilliant. Um, quest, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at the questions at the same time, trying to do two things at once. Every, and so, yeah, that's another thing. Ever just things do go wrong and not getting uh, bent out of shape about it and just plowing on is part of life. And adapting as well to this new normal is, you know, we've all had to do it and people have done it at different um, speeds, you know. Um, obviously, Natalie was and Mimi were, were some of the first to actually adapt to this new normal and go online. And there's still people that are struggling with it. So I think there's some questions coming in now, Joe. so I'm gonna hand over to you. Well, I think I was gonna start actually with, with exactly what you've just said is uh, mentioning, you know, when things do go wrong, trying to stay calm, but it was just, uh, I think you both shared tips on how to prepare, but, but in that moment, do you have any tips for people on them? Um, you know, if they can't get their slides up or something, their sound isn't working or, or something like that. Yeah, I definitely have some tips to share. If you don't mind me going first, I would say that even if you are super duper duper prepared, you've spent, you know, however, in an infinite amount of time preparing for a presentation, there are always still things that could be unexpected and that can go wrong. And that's what my two tips I would say to that is firstly, the audience doesn't know what your talk, what your prepared talk was. So if, you know, you aren't able to access the slides at all or you've completely missed out a whole chunk of what you wanted to say to the audience they didn't actually know that and they're probably still you know carrying on listening as if it was what you had planned so sometimes we can overreact but just keep that in mind that the audience didn't know what your planned talk was and the second tip I would say is that the audience is sort of mirroring and picking up sort of your, your tone your attitude to everything that's going on um, so if you are suddenly freaking out or being really nervous, then they'll become uncomfortable as well. But if you carry on sort of as smoothly as you can, um, then the audience will also carry on listening and uh, enjoying the talk in the same way. So, yeah, those are my two, my two tips for when things don't go to plan. Um, so for me, um, when things go to plan, which is basically my life story, nothing's ever planned for me anyway. Um, is to stay calm. So that's my first tip, literally just stay calm. So um, actually yesterday I had an incident where my presentation wasn't working and I just kind of said, bear with me lads. You know, as for me, it's always cracking a joke. And at a time when we are, people aren't used to us um, communicating online, things do go wrong. Technology does have its, have its issues. So for me, it's just kind of going, 
sorry guys bear with me one moment or um sometimes what i also tend to do is kind of just talk what i was meant to say anyway because like natalie said nobody knows that it was not meant to be or what it was meant to be so just keep going yeah that's great um Mimi, sticking with you, you talked about the Myers-Briggs personality types and how your personality type was quite different to a lot of other engineers. And I guess we all know now that having diversity of all sorts, and I think including personality types around the table is really, really important. So do you have any thoughts on how we maybe attract and retain those people who, who don't have necessarily the stereotypical, I'll call it, engineering personality type so we can get that? diversity and I'll link to that and um, Julie Harrison has asked as well how do we keep girls in engineering so I think it's um maybe if we can take those as a, as a pair of questions yeah um so one thing that's really kept me in engineering as much as, as even though I really love civil engineering but one thing that's allowed me to um stay is actually using the skills that I have that are my strongest so as I said in my presentation um I've done a lot of public speaking um, whether that be STEM ambassadors, whether that be at work, like I'm allowed to, I've been able to talk about things that I care about. And I know that, like I said before, that my communication skills were like, I would like to say, I would maybe, are one of my strongest. And even if, for example, I feel like my technical abilities aren't as great, um, I've been given those opportunities to actually try to enhance those skills through public speaking still. So it's kind of, that but how we keep girls in engineering um allowing letting them know that there are multitudes of way most multitudes of careers in engineering it's not just the hardcore maths and physics and it's engineering is what you want it to be if you have an interest there is an engineering for it and i think it's really explaining all of the jobs that are there you don't have to be outside builders bomb or whatever it is and you know being dirty you can be in an office very 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 well um well the air conditioned um and not having to do this sort of manual labor if you want to do manual labor you can do manual labor but literally if you have an interest in something there is an engineering for it so i think it's really focusing on that as well that it's not just maths and physics it's makeup it's horses and i can give an example i did some public speaking um i think it was about a year ago now and um, a girl said that she's got a strong interest in horses. And I said, and she said, oh, how can engineering encompass that? I said, actually, I've got a friend who's a product design engineer and he designs bespoke horse carriages and he works with horses every single day. So if you can really like marry the two, um, someone's interest and engineering together, please do that because it's so important. People don't know the jobs and the careers that are out there. So just explain to them that you can put these two together. And that's how I would encompass women into engineering. Yeah, something I would like to add to that is firstly, I really like how the question was phrased. I, in my role working with lots of different schools, I really don't like it when people say that, how do we get young women and girls interested in STEM? Because they already are yeah. and naturally curious. They already have that interest and actually maybe they get turned off from it. And sometimes at a later stage, but sometimes at a very early age, which is a shame. Um, I think definitely to add on to what Mimi said, it's, it's about sharing the opportunities that are there. And um, like anyone, young women are looking for opportunities in their career. And sometimes um, they aren't given them. Sometimes they don't hear about it. And um, people will follow where they see career opportunities. And that needs to be uh, sort of shared a bit more so that people are actually um, more, more, more interested to pursue different education and career paths. Yeah, that's great. We've got another question here for both of you. Uh, how do you avoid procrastination? Hmm. That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> my, my quick tip is definitely to break it down into lots of small actions. The reason that I procrastinate is when I see a task is so massive, I don't even know how to get started. As a side note, I would often find that when I actually get started on the task, I'll realise it only took you know far less time, maybe 20 minutes took far less time than I thought it would. Um, but I just kept putting it off because in my head it was a massive task and of course the longer you leave it the bigger it seems and um, so something that I would say is yeah to break it down into sort of really small actionable tasks that you can do sort of within five minutes like or starting right now so yeah that's a big one for me whether it's a school report or a piece of work or a presentation anything um, break it down. Um, I'm going to echo Natalie on that and I think for me 
this is actually really before my dissertation when I was at university doing my 15,000 words or whatever it was and for me it was just just do it just do it just open the open the so if, if it's a dissertation open the word document title it even if you don't start it you've technically started because you saved the document and that's kind of how I like to think of things as in that he said break it down into small into small little actionable tasks and just kind of work through them and make sure you have all of the information that you need in order to start the task as well so I feel like that's when people start to procrastinate when you feel like you don't have enough information or you don't know where to start get all of that information and then just crack on yeah so Natalie, in your uh, talk, you shared that after doing your absolutely huge, amazing presentation that you've managed to leave a lot of your nerves behind. Mimi, do you feel the same or do you still get nervous? Um, I still get nervous. Um, I don't know. I just feel like anytime I'm going to speak to somebody, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's kind of it's so funny because I talk about being confident and all these kind of things, but it's very normal to be nervous as I always say it's very healthy to be nervous not to the point where it's you know taking over your whole life you can't get out of bed every day but it's very normal to be nervous talking to anybody no matter how big or small the group is is a bit nerve-wracking so yes I do still get nervous every day. Uh, another question for both of you um what type of role models have influenced you? I'll go first mine is quite cliche um my mother um, my mom is my best friend. She's my confidant. She's literally, my mom means everything to me. And, um, she's the embodiment of hard work. And if I could be half the woman she is, I will be the happiest person on the planet. So, yeah. For me, uh, someone who I often go to, in, um, as a role model for someone who's really thought found their voice is, um, Chanel Miller, who's an illustrator and author. Um, she was the anonymous woman in a very high profile, uh, highly publicized sexual assault case. And actually she was anonymous for the whole time during that very uh, well reported um, trial. And of course, everyone was sharing their opinions of what happened and um, the, the situation and how the, uh, the court case should sort of end up. And she came out much later to share her own story in her own book that's called Know My Name. And it's something which I found really powerful because it's obviously a very difficult topic to talk about. It's her story at the end of the day. And she sort of came out publicly to share it um, at a time when a lot of different people who had never met her were sharing their opinions. So yeah, I think there was a lot of strength and sort of boldness in that. Definitely. Um, I think in both of your presentations, you talked on um, sort of doing rehearsals and making sure that you feel really well prepared. And um, there is a comment here of is, is there such a thing as sort of too much rehearsal? And um, the person who's asked the question has said that they don't normally rehearse too much and finding that that means that on the day their speech flows a bit better. Yeah, I think sometimes when you rehearse too much, what tends to happen is you start to form like a like a script and if you don't fit that script if you miss a word you kind of throw your whole self off so I think what I try to do is have just sort of cues on my presentation that kind of reminds me what to say so when I'm uh, uh, practicing I will have different versions each time I'm doing the whole presentation of what I may have said so even if I I don't know don't say at I say something else I've done another version of it so I can still kind of keep going and it's not too much of a problem and also remembering that on the day that you can be nervous even while you're speaking. So you may go on a different tangent or you may remember another personal anecdote and it's absolutely fine to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree in terms of um, what I said before, that the audience doesn't know what script you're going to follow. But I'm definitely guilty of when I have sort of um, practice what I was going to say a lot when I'm actually speaking in the back of my head I'll be thinking oh I worded that better last time but actually it doesn't matter because the audience is is hearing it and uh, it's good to not get too much into my own head ultimately it depends on your your individual style what you know works best for you and that's the kind of thing that comes out with practice so sort of grabbing opportunities to practice and deliver different types of talks and um, because there will be some which you want to have in a more sort of chatty style but there will be other types of talks that you want to make sure you have all the information in there and that could be one that uh, requires a little bit more of a script or rehearsals yeah absolutely there's another question here, uh, thinking back to earlier on in your career, um, did you suffer from imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you manage it? Yes. 
Um, <laughs> so I think I still suffer from it now, you know. Um, so there are some days I come to work. Um, so for me, it could be more that there's probably a diversity issue, a big diversity issue within engineering. So most places I go into are dom predominantly male, white, um, further up organisations. I don't see anybody who looks like me. So sometimes I'm a bit like, hmm, can I really get to that point? Or um, is there anyone, is there anyone who looks like me kind of thing? Or like, where's my career going to go? And am I actually really meant to be here? But again, when I wake up in the morning, I kind of look at myself and I say, you know, I am meant to be here. I worked hard. I went to university. I've done all of these things. I've passed the exams. How high the level I passed them is a different story, but I still passed the exams. And um, I've done all of the, the correct, um, correct. I mean, the, the pathway in order to be where I am today. So I do deserve to be here. And it's all of those um, affirmations that I say to myself every morning that kind of helps me come up with the imposter syndrome. And also, again, being awarded from the Institution of Civil Engineering, which is the home of civil engineering, so I must be somewhat decent. <laughs> yeah, I have conflicting opinions about imposter syndrome, and I know that I included it in my presentation. Um, the best way that I could put it is there was, there was a really great article that came out of Harvard Business Review earlier this year, which said, which was titled, Stop Telling Women That They Have Imposter Syndrome. And just to quickly summarise it, it was about how actually the, the problem is not the individuals having this, you know, syndrome, which sounds like a health problem, um, but it's actually the environment that they're in. Um, you know, it may be a not very diverse workplace. They may not have as many peers and stuff around them who are having the same experiences that they feel open talking about. And that leads to imposter syndrome. But actually, the sense of belonging doesn't come from the individual. It comes from the environment that they're in. And we all have actions to take to make sure that our workplaces are as inclusive as they can be. With imposter syndrome, I think it's a bit of a myth that you experience it more when you're sort of um, junior level and then you grow out of it I would actually say that you experience it more and more as you rise up through your career and different ranks because you um, enter a higher position and that will actually lead to more imposter syndrome thinking am I supposed to be here I'm not qualified enough they're going to find out that I'm not as good as they think I am and they're going to they're going to fire me like all of these thoughts are I would say are just just as likely to happen if not more later on in your career and I think I heard that like, I think it was Hillary Clinton, you know, someone who is very, very, very high up in her field who um, experienced a lot of imposter syndrome. So I would say that, yeah, it's a bit of a myth that it's only really for, you know, early career starters, junior levels. Um, but I don't want to say that to put people off, to scare people. Um, rather, I want to share it because we need to overcome imposter syndrome and be aware of it from an early stage because it is going to be something that continues um, throughout our careers and our lives so the sooner we can get to grips with it the better yeah I like that so that potentially the the amount of imposter syndrome you feel will potentially stay the same or even slightly increased but if you've got better ways of managing it and mm. dealing with it yourself then then um, getting those in place early on definitely makes makes it all easier and, and it's a good thing what would you say is the best mistake that you've learned from? Failing my A-levels. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure people know, know my story, but I wanted to be a medical professional, but then um, didn't really do well at A-level. So then I studied for another degree um, that I realized I didn't actually enjoy. And then one of my friends introduced me to civil engineering. And I think that was the best decision of my life. So if I didn't fail my A-levels, I potentially would have been a medical professional and not really, I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm so much more passionate about civil engineering than I ever was about being this medical professional. So it kind of makes me question most days, why did I want to be a medical professional? If, was it just the status? What, what, like, what was it surrounding? But because I'm so passionate about civil engineering, so passionate about concrete and so passionate about STEM engagement in relation to engineering. and that's not the same passion that I had when you asked me about me being a medical professional. So I really do think failing my levels, as bad as that sounds, um, was the best thing that happened to me. 
something that I would say that I really learned from was um, at university, I was part of a student group that delivered STEM interactive STEM workshops to um, groups of teenagers from local schools. And we spent so much time thinking about ways to make sure that it was really engaging and inclusive and interesting for the teenagers. And actually what we found with one of the schools that we delivered it to was, it was actually the members of staff, so there's the school teachers who were on this school trip to the university, they were actually the ones who were being the most disruptive and asking lots of questions and interrupting and taking us sort of off course for the workshop session plan. And something that I really, really learned from that is because I had to be very adaptable and start sort of communicating with the members of staff in a different way. And because of that, like being able to influence them and bring in um, the rest of the room, sort of to bring on the rest of the room to continue the workshop. And that was something which was really difficult to, um, do at the time because I was sort of thinking my feet but actually what I've learned from that is whatever room you're in um sort of being able to influence the key influences in the room um, is the best way to get the whole room on board and I find that really really useful in um like scary client meetings as well yeah that's great uh, do you both have a routine when you are preparing for talks The main thing I do when I first start preparing the talk is ultimately think about where the audience is coming from. So that includes sort of what are they interested in? What do they already know? And also what do I want them to get out of that session? And so starting off with that provides me with a bit of a structure and allows me to make sure the rest of my talk preparation has the direction that it needs um, rather than just throwing things together and hoping, hoping that the message will come out in the end. And yeah, really being clear about what the audience knows, doesn't already know, and what I want them to know by the end of the session. Um, that's the first thing that I do. And then from that building on the structure, any sort of interactive elements I think are really important, whether it's a full blown activity or just a couple of questions for the audience to participate in. Um, yeah, that's sort of my, my main structure. Um, I'm the same as Natalie, I'm just gonna echo what Natalie said. So yeah, most importantly, where the audience are coming from, who's gonna be there, uh, what they're interested in, and then I kind of build from there. So it's basically the same. All right then. Have you found that there's a benefit to using a differing presentation style depending on the gender mix of your audience? And um, the person who's asked the question says they they have their own opinion on it. So maybe while you're answering, they could pop their opinion in the chat as well. So do you do you change your presentation depending on the gender of the, the people you're presenting to? That's really interesting. And I would say that I I might do, but I wouldn't like to. So I might do it unconsciously, but I would try to counteract that and not change my presentation style depending on the gender mix. I think there can be assumptions that um, when we're talking about, for example, today, confidence is sort of lean too much on things like imposter syndrome if there's a lot of women in the room. And it's the same when I'm speaking to volunteers who are going to speak to young people. I don't want them to lean on sort of assumptions and stereotypes about what the young people might be interested in. For example, assuming that boys in the class are going to be more interested in football than horses. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want to make assumptions about the audience based on their gender. No, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever thought about that, to be fair. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know, because I don't think I've ever thought about that when I've done a presentation. Oh, there's more boys in the room, why don't I do this? No, I don't think I've ever, I don't think so. If if I have, then I'm going to change that and I'll think about it more consciously, but I don't think I have. <laughs> right then and um i think one last question for us to end on it's a, a good one for us to end on is what is the one thing that you would like to be remembered for what do you want your legacy to be oh that's a big question i would like my legacy to be and um, creating a platform and ultimately sharing it with other people so not just amplifying what other underrepresented voices are saying but actually passing passing the mic or sending the elevator back down to pick up other people to the platform that I've created, whatever metaphor you want to use. That's what the legacy I want to have. That's so interesting because I've never really thought about what I want to be remembered for. Um, probably being a fantastic human being. Um, I don't really know. I Honestly, I don't know what I'd like to be remembered for, but I think... Yeah, probably be remembered for giving back to my community because that is so important to me. Like, are you, I feel like my level of success or knowing how successful I've been is how much I've been able to impact the community and people around me. So that's what I'd like to be remembered for, yeah. And that I'm a fantastic human being, but yeah. 
fabulous. Great. Well, I've just got to say thank you, ladies. That was truly inspiring. Both of your stories are truly inspiring. And it shows that when you have a voice and when you use it in the correct way, the, the change it can make and uh, how we can all actually work towards um, making the world that better place and bringing other people up to where, to where you ladies are. And uh, that it's all, uh, everybody's got it with, within them. Um, you know, you may not, might not feel like it today, but when you're having a, a good day, maybe you can concentrate on doing some good stuff um which won't necessarily get to the same high heights that uh, you've both got to but um every little helps when it talks when we're all talking about making the workplace more diverse making it more welcoming for people and making the world just that better place um i'd like to just say that thank you to everybody as well as our speakers all attendees for the great engagement thank you for all of the people that helped organize this and uh, all the people behind the scenes these things don't happen by magic um but what will happen by magic because i'm not doing it is after this event uh laura's going to help us get it onto youtube so i'll share the link with everybody that booked on the system and obviously our speakers uh, so we can watch again and I honestly think that this is an event that can be shared wide, wide, widely <laughs> and uh, many people can benefit from knowing that not everybody's perfect and not everybody um, you know can go out there and, and do things when they first start off but that little bit chipping away at it um, means that we can all do great things. So I think with that, I'm just going to say thank you very much to our speakers. It has been an absolute pleasure. I've worked with you both before and I hope I'll work with you both again. Um, got to say, yay, yay for civil engineers. Uh, myself, Mimi and Natalie are all civil engineers. And I have to say it is the best profession. But, you know, um, I'll let the rest of you shake your head, Joe. <laughs> and just that's it thank you very much for everybody it has been an absolute pleasure and uh hope to see you at some of our other events we've got two more events coming up uh one in a fortnight's time and one two weeks after that uh all to help us uh to inspire us to make the most of our new normal great so thank you very much cheers everyone bye concrete bye thanks thank bye. you so much thank you Laura, do you want to stop?